We're going to conclude this semester by finishing up our discussion of the cardiovascular system. You may recall that the cardiovascular system is comprised of the heart, which we discussed in really good detail in the previous unit in our, our uh, associated lab activities, and other structures including the blood vessels and the blood. And so today, and maybe into tomorrow, we're going to talk about the structure of the blood, vessels, just kind of the primary types of blood vessels and anatomically what's different about them, and then correlate that with the blood flow which travels through them, and as well as the blood pressure. And then uh, probably on Thursday, we'll talk about the blood really briefly with chapter 15, and then um, the next week, we'll conclude the semester with our respiratory system on Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday, Thursday with the renal system. So, in other words, the cardiovascular system is traversing the second or the third and the fourth units. So, anybody know what type of blood vessels we have in our body? What kind of blood vessels do we have? What's the name of some types of vessels? We have veins, arteries, and capillaries. Okay, those are the main types of vessels. Um, that we'll discuss, and we'll add a couple more in there called arterioles and venules, okay, which are variants of arteries and veins, okay? And then we'll look at what their primary jobs are for distributing our blood throughout our body. You may recall the distribution of blood through the heart, we sit and through the rest of the body between the pulmonary and systemic circuits. We learned that even though we have one heart, we can functionally divide it into the left heart, which distributes blood to which circuit? Systemic. And the right heart, which propels blood to the pulmonary circuit. Trying to just deliver nutrients, distribute, pick out whatever the case may be. What we're going to learn is the arteries take blood which way? In respect to the heart. Away from the heart. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, but veins must carry it back to the heart. In the capillaries, what do they do? That's where the exchange happens, between nutrients and gases or whatever, between our blood and our, and our body tissue, right, wherever those capillaries are located. And then what we're going to add today is between arteries and capillaries are these things called arterioles. So the artery, arterial, capillary, then this other structure called a venule, and then we'll lead to these things called veins. Obviously, all of our <laughs> organs are going to need blood flow right, to meet their metabolic demands, but some organs receive more blood flow than what they need to just kind of maintain homeostasis. And some classic examples include the digestive system. Why do you think your digestive organs might receive more blood flow than what that organ itself might need to keep alive? Okay, so she said like to carry away waste. Why else? Very good. Why else might we see more blood flow going to the digestive system besides just carrying away waste? Give me a little more detail. Like, okay, so let's go to a different organ. Why might the kidneys meet, need more blood flow than the kidney tissue itself needs to be kept alive? What is the kidney? What does it do? Filter what? blood, so we better send it a whole heck of a lot of blood, okay? Skin might receive more blood than the skin needs to keep alive because why? It's a theme we've seen all semester. Why might the skin receive extra blood flow? Heat dissipation, right? Okay. We've got excessive blood going to the skin. It's not because the skin's metabolizing more. It's because the skin's trying to liberate out heat, right? And so not all organs receive the exact amount of blood flow which they need just to keep those tissues alive. We get extra blood flow there to do something extra for the blood. And those organs are called reconditioning organs. They're called reconditioning organs because they're trying to 
recondition of blood. So again, I would receive excessive blood flow to my digestive system, say to the stomach, to do what? Or the intestines to do what? <coughs> How would the how does how do the intestines recondition the blood? What are they fixing? Digestive system gives us nutrients. Okay, so we got an extra blood flow to the digestive system to do what with these nutrients? To spread them out. So first we got to pick them up there and then distribute them. Okay, and so. Um, those organs that receive excessive blood flow, more than those tissues need, are called reconditioning organs. Can you think of another organ in your body that would be considered a reconditioning organ that receives more excessive blood flow, more than its metabolic needs? The kidneys. Kidneys, okay, great, got those, good. What else? Hearts, Hearts? great example, right? Its whole job is to pump blood, so it better get all, all <laughs> of your blood being distributed through it. Very good, so heart's a great example. Brain, brain receives a disproportionate amount of blood flow, but it's not for reconditioning, okay, but it's a good guess. It does receive a whole heck of a lot of blood, but it's actually proportionate to its needs. Okay, so good guess, so. The lungs are a great example where we're going. Uh, they receive excessive blood flow, right, to match your, right, as you, right, exercise. You've got to bring more blood flow to the lungs to get rid of that excessive oxygen that's accumulating in the body. Okay. So not only just to keep the lung tissue alive, but right, keep the, the blood at set point. Okay. So if I use the term reconditioning organ, does that make sense? It's an organ that receives not <coughs> homeostatic set point range for that organ blood levels, but more to help bring some other factor in the body back to homeostasis. Okay. The rest of our body organs, say the brain, or say your skeletal muscles or whatever the case may be, they're gonna receive the precise amount of blood flow to maintain their homeostasis, to make sure nutrients are delivered and waste are removed at adequate rate. Okay. And so in other words, what we're gonna study is the rate of blood flow to particular organs is gonna be changed, and we'll see how, how does our body alter this blood flow. Okay. If we use the term blood flow, we can actually quantitate it. It's the actual V, what does that stand for? Volume, Volume of blood, right, going through a, wherever you're looking at, a vessel, organ, okay, tissue, whatever, uh, or the whole body, whatever you're looking at, and it's, you can measure it in milliliters per minute or liters per minute. And if you're looking at your whole body blood flow, that's basically your cardiac output at rest. Remember how we calculated that using our <coughs> blood pressure and our heart rate? You can determine your whole body's blood flow by calculating your cardiac output. We know that the blood flow distribution when you're at rest, so when the parasympathetic nervous system is prevailing, you shouldn't see any crazy wild fluctuations. The blood flow going to the brain or the feet or whatever, right? It should be pretty consistent because you're at rest, conserved, right? We don't need to see any of these wild fluctuations. But the last statement is that individual organs receive different amounts of blood flow, depending if they are reconditioning or more active or not, or whatever the case may be. As noted, for example, the brain receives like 20% of the blood flow, even though it's not 20% of your body mass uh, under right resting condition. <coughs> so blood flow, if we were just to define, it's just the volume of blood going through whatever you're looking at over a period of time. You're quantitating the volume over a period of time. Another term that we're gonna use is also blood pressure. We've become familiar with thanks to lab last week. And if we were to quantitate or kind of define this, this is actual force. And we're gonna measure this in millimeters of mercury. The force over a given area on the wall of a vessel that's containing blood. Our measuring in millimeters of mercury. <coughs> When you're measuring blood pressure in your patients, right, when you go out and work, um, if you remember, we're measuring it in our systemic circuit as close as you can get the aorta. Okay, try to represent as accurately as you can. Okay, 
So if someone doesn't have an arm, you would try to get as close as you can to the legs or whatever the case may be. But the, what we know, and we're going to repeat here, the further you get away from the heart, what happens to that pressure? It decreases. It declines. And so we try to measure it as close to the heart as we can. That's why we go with the, the arm measurement. And we also know from concluding in at three that differences in blood pressure, or I could have just as well said a blood pressure gradient, keeps the blood moving and from a higher to a lower pressure. <clears throat> you might as well just put it out there. The pressure we know is greatest where? Where's the blood pressure the greatest in respect to the heart? Coming out of the left side, so which vessel is that? Aorta. And the least at the another vessel that returns to the right side? Vena. The vena cava. Okay. The blood pressure gradient is going to keep uh, blood moving from that high to low pressure. You okay on the terms about blood flow or blood pressure, what the terms mean? We became familiar as well with a term called resistance at the end of the third unit. And I said, well, <coughs> introduce it then and we'll better clarify it. Unit four, so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to talk about resistance factors. And resistance factors are those which actually oppose the flow of blood through a particular vessel. At first hand, it doesn't make sense. If you think about, well, the blood vessels are there to distribute blood. Why is there any opposition? And there's just anatomically, naturally built-in resistance factors. And it's due to, primarily due to right, friction as blood travels through the vessels. We'll add a few resistance factors. But um, the bulk of our resistance factors come from the systemic circuit which we said, how could we, what was our evidence that the systemic circuit has a lot of resistance compared to the pulmonary circuit? What about the heart, teacher? The, the muscle's thicker. The muscle's thicker on the left side, the left ventricle, than the right ventricle. And primarily because there's just more physical resistance uh, to the flow of blood out in the systemic circuit. And so you can call it Resistance, you can call it peripheral resistance because the resistance factors are out in the periphery of the body. Okay, so out away from the heart, basically. If we look at um, the things which contribute to resistance, and there are three factors. It looks like it spans over onto the next page. But the first is called viscosity. What does that mean? that word viscous to describe something? What does the term viscous kind of imply? Thickness and how that, very good, how it flows. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to speak over you. How something, so we're talking about a fluid. Okay, so we're looking at how thick, or the term I have here, sticky something is, and more specifically the blood. The blood has a relative amount of viscosity. And it's a fluid, it's going to have some viscosity. And it's going to have, obviously, a set point amount of viscosity. We don't want the blood to be so viscous or sticky that it's like syrup, right? And oozy and, and not going to flow. But on the flip side, we don't want it so uh, less sticky that it's like water flowing through a pipe, where it's just zipping through the vessels, right? So we've got to have this intermediate. And it's not going to naturally be too viscous. It's going to be right because our blood is not just water. It's not just sugar. It's a conglomerate of sugar and salts and proteins and all kinds of good stuff in there. However, if the blood viscosity changes, the resistance of the blood flow changes and therefore the blood flow changes to a particular organ. So as our blood becomes more viscous or more thick, our blood flow will decrease. Can you think of something that would cause your blood to become more viscous and decrease blood flow? What, are, what kind of condition, so out of homeostasis, do you think might cause your blood to become viscous and sticky? Dehydration. 
Dehydration. Okay, very good. So your water content goes down, but your blood has red blood cells, platelets, <coughs> white blood cells. And so we just increase the uh, viscosity. Very good. Can you think of any other condition that might cause your blood to become too viscous? And go along with the theme of sticky. What might make your blood too? What makes stuff sticky? Sugar. So maybe if you're diabetic, your blood becomes too viscous and your blood flow is not adequate. Right? You ever know anybody who has any foot disease or whatever because their blood flow is just not getting down there? So clearly, the viscosity of the blood is going to dictate how well the blood flows through a particular vessel. We obviously want the viscosity to be adequate to allow for the blood flow to be precise, not too slow, not too fast. Within a person, the viscosity <coughs> should be pretty consistent from moment to moment. Okay, so you shouldn't find your blood right now be so sticky and then now too liquid, right? <coughs> Over a period of a few days, the, the constant of your blood is, is fairly constant, right? Does that make sense? So that's going to be a pretty st steady thing. In other words, it's not going to fluctuate. But that does provide resistance to the flow of blood. Another thing that you may not have thought about before is actually the length of the vessel or the length at which the tube that the blood has to travel through contributes to resistance factors. The longer a blood vessel is, compared to say a meter long vessel versus a foot long vessel, yeah, the longer the vessel is, just the physical greater surface area that the blood has to drag against. Okay? So even though the vessel is transporting the blood, the blood is dragging along the vessel and that hinders the flow of blood. That backs into what we said though, our peripheral, our systemic circuit, right, the blood vessels that go out, say to all the, the bottom of your toes, much more distance than say the blood vessels in the pulmonary circuit where they have to go to the heart. Okay. So again, the systemic circuit has longer blood vessels compared to the pulmonary circuit, so the systemic circuit has greater source of resistance simply to the, the length of the blood vessels. Does that make some sense? So even though the blood vessels are there to transport, it's just physically a little bit of a drag. Um, do you think your blood vessel length will change quickly once you've grown? No. Okay, that too is not going to fluctuate unless you have some traumatic injury, right? You lose an appendage, or maybe if you're pregnant, then that's obviously going to change the number of blood vessels. Um, but generally, in the healthful adult, the blood vessel length shouldn't be fluctuating. So that's a constant that's always there and, and not changing. So it leads us up to a factor of resistance that does fluctuate, that does change, and it's the diameter of our blood vessels. What does that mean? The diameter of the blood vessels. The what? The width of it, right? The width of it can be more or less depending upon really just going back to our sympathetic nervous system. Now going back to our sympathetic nervous system can influence this. Our blood vessel diameters can change really quickly, and we'll, we'll review it formally, but they can dilate really quickly or constrict really quickly. Which state do you think is going to give more resistance, the dilated or the constricted state? Constricted. The constricted state. Okay, so um, if I want to decrease resistance, the blood vessel needs to relax, and if I want to increase resistance, the blood vessel will contract or constrict. And so it's going to be an inverse relationship between the resistance factors. Okay. And so if we wanted to kind of put a connection to the flow of blood through a particular organ, tied in with blood pressure and tied in resistance, 
seeing which one influences uh, the blood flow through a particular organ. So I'll walk you through it. This is saying the blood flow is directly related to the blood pressure what? Change. Change or gradient, right? The bigger the gradient, the flow is bigger. Okay. The bigger the gradient, the greater the flow of blood. So it's a direct relationship. So here, if the pressure gradient goes up, the blood flow goes up. If the pressure gradient drops, the blood flow goes down. Your pressure gradient should always be pretty what? Pretty steady, right? When we did our blood pressure, you measured your 130 over 90 whatever, right? Measured it then to be about that. Measured it three days later, be about that, right? That pressure gradient, pretty consistent unless you exercise or right, something like that. And so it has a direct effect on the distribution of blood. Okay, pressure goes up, blood flow goes up. Okay. Resistance has what type of relationship? Inverse, okay? So what we summarize is that um, resistance factors actually hinder the flow of blood to a particular organ. We increase the resistance factors, the blood flow to that organ goes down. So if we increase viscosity, if we increase vessel length, uh, or what else am I missing? Uh, decrease diameter. The blood flow to an organ is actually going to slow down. So pressure gradient increases blood flow, but resistance actually hinders the flow of blood to an organ. So the question is then, which is going to have the biggest influence on blood to an organ? We said our pressure gradient is always pretty consistent. Length is always consistent. Uh, viscosity is always consistent. But what can be changed? Diameter. The diameter of resistance. So which between resistance and pressure gradient do you think is really going to distribute blood through your body? resistance. Okay. And so therefore, if I want to change blood flow to a particular organ, I need to change <coughs> resistance. And really more specifically, what part of resistance? Mm -hmm. Diameter. Very good. through a particular organ by quantitating its velocity. Blood flow, uh, you can call perfusion, and I want you to make this a familiar word. We're going to use it next week. Please don't forget it. If I said perfusion, I'm talking tissue perfusion, I'm talking about blood flow. Okay. Where I'm going to talk about this is in the lungs. We're going to talk about perfusion, ventilation, matching. Match blood flow with air flow. So tell every semester, and they, I forget, even though they remember this, right? I circle it. That week off messes with you for some reason. But uh, I could talk about blood flow, or I could say tissue perfusion. Um, we know it's just gonna. This is a summary of why we need blood flow. What we learned early in the semester: the blood is going to go to an organ to deliver oxygen, to deliver nutrients, to pick up waste. Uh, exchange gases in the lungs, exchange gases in the tissues, pick up nutrients, get rid of waste by the renal system, right? That's just kind of a snapshot of what we understood the, uh, the circulatory system does. And we know that where we're headed is the body is going to regulate that blood flow to particular organs, whether they be reconditioning organs or not. The body, the nervous system is going to 
make sure the blood flow is adequate to each and every one of our organs to make sure they maintain homeostasis. Good. So now where we're going to go is look at the different types of blood vessels and their structures. Oh, sorry. Getting ahead of myself. Uh, if we look at the blood velocity, it's actually going to change throughout each of the vessels. So the speed of the blood is not equivalent throughout all organs nor between all blood vessels. So it's going to fluctuate. And I want to give you a caution. Why don't you, on the margin over here, besides filling everything else right now, do not confuse the velocity with the pressure. Do not confuse speed with pressure. We're going to look at speed, we're going to look at pressure. Okay. We're talking about speed at this moment. We are not talking about the pressure of the blood in a vessel at this moment. If we look at the velocity of the blood through a particular vessel, it's going to be linked inverse, inversely to what's described as a cross-sectional area of the blood vessel to be filled. It's a lot of shorthand notes, but basically, as the cross-sectional area increases, so if I do cross-sectional the tissue and I see a whole heck of a lot of a particular vessel and less of another, the vessel that has a whole lot of surface area in that organ, the blood flow will be more what? If it's inversely proportionate. So I've got a lot of that vessel type in there, the speed is slow down. Okay. Which makes sense because our capillary beds actually have the greatest cross-sectional area in any tissue, so the velocity is the what? In our, our, our capillaries. The velocity of blood is the <coughs> slowest. Okay. Although the pressure is still declining. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. So the, the pressure drops, or excuse me, I'm going to do it. I told you not to do it. The speed drops significantly in our capillaries. Then our, we'll see the speed actually pick up after the capillaries. Speed's going to pick up, but pressure will continue to decline. So we'll talk about why that is in just a moment. And at this point, I just want you to acknowledge that um, if a vessel takes up a lot of space in a particular tissue, the speed of the blood in that tissue is going to slow down. And where we're going, it might be easier for you to visually kind of wrap your head around this, to think, think of your vessels analogous to streets and highways, and the blood being traffic the cars, right, moving through those areas. Let's see if I try to pack um, a thousand cars, if I wanted to drive a thousand cars through your little hometown, Hinton, wherever you're from, okay, and, or I wanted to drive them through Interstate 35 between Guthrie and, and Oklahoma City. Even though there's one Interstate 35 versus all the streets in your little town, there's more surface area for the cars to take up in the small town versus in the street. Which scenario do you think the cars could travel faster? The small town or the interstate? Interstate. interstate. Oh, don't go in your town. <laughs> they would actually be able to drive faster on the interstate because there's just less space. There's just less space to take up. Yes, I mean, less to fill and, and take up. Take time getting to the streets than getting through them. And that's kind of what the blood does as well. So in these analogies, think about arteries as like the major highways. And the same thing with the, vein, uh, the veins. And think about the capillaries like the city streets. Getting to and from the, the highways and the city streets, you have like the off-ramps. Okay? And what happens at the off-ramps? Congestion, right? And so similar to slow down, right? Similar kind of thing happens in our in our blood vessels. So th it might help you a little bit understanding how the flow of blood changes through our vessels if you make that tangible 
uh, scenario. <coughs> Uh, if we look at this relationship, go ahead at this point, make reference to figure 14.5 to check that out about the blood flow and the cross-sectional area between the vessels of the body. The vessels which we're going to study include, if we look at leaving the left side of the heart at the aorta, those will lead to arteries, which we now have an idea will lead to these things called arterioles. Then capillaries, which do uh, gas ex nutrient gas exchange. Then open back up the venules, which open back up the vein. Okay, and then lead to the vena cava. The chart at the bottom is looking at the uh, cross-sectional area. Okay, so we see the, in the green line, which vessels have the cross, greatest cross-sectional area? Capillaries least including our aorta and vena cava. Okay, so we can see this change in cross-sectional area of the body. We can also see this inverse relationship with the second chart of velocity. Speed is greatest in the aorta, and then the speed plummets where? It's, it bottoms out the capillaries. Where do we see the significant drop off though? Arterials, because those are like our off ramps, right? In that analogy, right, where it plugs up. But once you get to the city streets, to the capillaries, the speed or the velocity is nice and slow. Then the cross sectional area begins to decline, so our velocity actually increases, right? Once we get into our venules and our veins and then back into the vena cava. So we see this crazy decline in pressure and then incline back up, or I'm sorry, this decline in a velocity, and the velocity speed actually picks back up through the vessels. What questions do you have at this point about the difference, it's about the difference with the relationship between the cross-sectional area and the velocity, or the speed of blood through the different types of vessels that our body has? Can you see that oppositeness, inverse relationship? If we look at the vessels, um, we know that our blood vessels right, distribute blood to and from the heart. And we also know the three primary types of vessels, including our arteries, as we identified a moment ago, that take blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood towards the heart. And it's the capillaries that actually carry out the exchange with our tissues. And we'll have a better idea how that happens probably on tomorrow. Tomorrow's So figure 13-2 reiterates this directionality. So whether you're looking at the pulmonary or the systemic circuit, any vessel that takes blood away is called an artery. Any blood that returns is called a vein. Where people get confused and kind of messed up is they want to throw in the oxygen content of the vessel, which is not a good way to, to really understand. The best way to understand the role of the vessels is directionality. Uh, veins carry blood towards the heart. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. I want to take a moment to uh, study figure 14.5 from your textbook, which compares and contrasts the structure of an artery versus a venule or vein, arterial, and capillary. I'm going to... Uh, Put the recording on pause. I'm going to give you a second just to kind of visually look at that and kind of make some connections about what's similar or different between these different vessels. Okay, so we've said that arteries are more musculature than veins and capillaries lack any musculature. We also just saw that veins do have valves. We do not see those in arteries and we can't see them they're not present in capillaries. What do you think the job of the valves is? Prevent the blood from going backwards. Very good. Very good. What else do you guys see? Very good. That's very good. The connective tissue is greater in the arteries than in the veins.
remains. Again, can we see it? Cannot see it at all in the capillaries. Very good. So it's very important that the connective tissue is present but well built around the arteries. And it's thicker in the arteries than it is in the veins. What else do you see? What else do you guys see? <clears throat> Look at the lumen of the vessels. Are they equivalent? The vein lumen diameter is greater than the artery and definitely greater than the capillaries. And so what's different if we change the lumen diameter? Pressure and less resistance. So blood pressure, blood has less resistance in the veins. velocity of the blood through each of the vessels. Of the vessels, the pressure is greatest in the systemic arteries. It'll continue to decline in the arterioles. It's intermediate in the capillaries and least in the veins. In your notes about that blood flow, blood pressure, that declining pressure through the system, the blood is actually described as pulsatile in which vessels? Which vessels did we measure our pulse in? Arteries. So why don't you add below your arteries that the blood pressure is pulsatile, or the blood flow is pulsatile? When it gets to the arteries, it's still, or excuse me, the arterioles, it's still pulsing a little bit. By the time you get to the end of the arterioles, the blood flow, do you think we should have pulsing high pressure blood here? The capillaries? And so, in the capillaries, the blood is no longer pulsatile. You can say the blood flow is steady. So if I know any other word I could use besides steady? Talk about a flow of a fluid. Consistent or uh, static means not changing, like not at all. I get where you're going with that. I don't know if it'd be a good one. It means like no. Uh, to me, that means like no blood flow. Could be do it. Constant was mentioned. Stable, and stable static. Okay, good alternatives. Um, the word I'm fishing for. Do I know? No? No, give it a dot. Um, have you heard they use, use the word laminar? Have you ever walked through um, a building that has that big sheet of air, like into a room that wants to keep flies out? Have you ever walked through a building like that or a room? One person has. Like a Walmart or something? Do they have like those air curtains? Or like some stores. Yeah, you walk. Mm -hmm. 
like a big gust, not when you get into the store, but like if you go back to where they keep their food or whatever, there's some of these like big air cartons. A better way to uh, describe that, you've ever flown in a plane? And it's just nice and steady. There is, the airflow is laminar, laminar. <coughs> Let's point this out, we'll use it in the, we'll use it in the uh, respiratory system as well, laminar airflow. The next time you go to the gas station or somewhere like that, see if you can walk through those, one of those laminar air curtains of a black thread walking through. Versus if you're in a plane, airflow could be laminar or what? Turbulence. Okay. So where I'm going is the blood flow is not turbulent in the capillaries, it's laminar, it's steady, it's constant. Static, go in all those words that you guys want to. In other words, our blood is no longer pulsing by the time it gets to the capillaries. So blood flow is pulsatile in the arteries constant, whatever you want to use, laminar in the capillaries, it also must be what in the veins? Constant. Once we drop that pulsatile nature, the blood flow is steady. Laminar, static, constant, not pulsing. So we talked about the pressure, it does what through the system? Decreases. It goes from also pulsatile to laminar, steady at the capillaries. But at, it actually it's, it's, it happens at the arterioles, but it's, you're right, at the capillaries and also the veins. Um, what else am I? Velocity, velocity is greatest, what can we add in here? The speed is greatest in the arteries, plummets at the arterial, so it's nice and constant, slow, low, the least at the capillaries, and the velocity does what between the venules and the veins? <coughs> Increases. So now we're adding that the velocity actually changes through the system. Greatest in the arteries, plummets of the arterioles, the least of the capillaries, and then picks up again at the veins. I just thought they carried blood in directions, right? <laughs> what they're doing is they're influencing pressure, velocity, resistance. Because the whole point is we need to have some action here at the capillaries. And so we may not get it to it fully addressed today, but those capillaries, even though they look not built well, they're built, they're structurally built to, their structure is built to function in gas exchange. So we don't need a nutrient exchange and etc. So we don't need smooth muscle. We don't need connective tissue all around us. Otherwise it just would hinder that gas that nutrient and gas exchange. Before I move on, what questions do you have about the structure of the different types of vessels or the pressure in the vessels or the velocity of the blood gener generically in the vessels? Fairly comfortable at this point. The next bit of our notes is just going to review which we just covered in this image. If you want additional detail, right, quantitating the features which we just discussed, refer to figure 14.6. And then I quantitate the thickness, the diameter, and et cetera, instead of just saying more or less. We identified that in our arteries, they have a large radius, not as large as the capillaries, but they still have a large uh, diameter lumen. And we know that the larger the diameter, the resistance goes down, which makes sense. We don't want to have 
resistance to blood flow as soon as it exits the heart. We don't have like a major amount of resistance to the blood flow as soon as it exits the heart. So we need to facilitate the air, the blood getting out of the heart. So it's going to have lower resistance when compared to, say, arterioles or capillaries. We're just trying to get the blood, uh, the BF stands for blood flow, out of, out of the heart. We identified it has the thickest layer of smooth muscle, and it's imperative that the artery system, our artery system is very elastic because the blood flow is what in our arteries? It's described as pulsatile. It's always stretching and, what do you say? It's always pulsing, right? So stretching and recoiling. And so therefore, when it stretches, we don't want it to do what? We don't want to stay stretched. We want it to stay stretched or even, what'd you say? I just want to say something. We don't want it to break. Anybody know anybody who's had one of these? Say your aorta? You survived it, you're awesome. But does anybody know anybody? Um, maybe getting out of your time era, but remember uh, John Ritter? Remember him? Okay. He died from his aorta, his connective tissue wouldn't accommodate and it broke. And so basically his aorta broke. And what happened? He died. Yeah, he bled to death, right? And so we want that s uh, smooth muscular nature and we want it to also be very elastic due to that connective tissue. So it can expand, right? Uh, as a stroke volume enters following ventricular, left ventricular systole. And we also know that after it expands, it's got to recoil. Mm -hmm. And when it recoils, it's going to, as described here, going to push, propel the blood away from the heart, out into the systemic circuit. <laughs> we also identified the blood flow is pulsatile. We can pick up your pulse okay. in your arteries. <coughs> Arteries, large, large diameter, low resistance, stretchy, because they've got to accommodate this pulsing high pressure blood, okay? They're going to lead to a set of blood vessels uh, called arterioles. Uh, before I move on, figure 14.7a illustrates how much, say, the uh, aorta needs to stretch out to accommodate that new uh, stroke volume. It's got to be really elastic. And then when it recoils, that aortic valve shuts and the blood goes out, out of the systemic circuit to meet your body's demands. And so our arteries, our large arteries, lead to our arterioles. So let's just talk about the arterioles in a little bit better detail. These are the smallest of the arteries. There's others than what we're elaborating on, but these are some of the major ones. The arterioles are the smallest. And they're the ones that control the blood flow to the capillary blood beds. And they are going to give us our greatest source of resistance. So th what drops significantly? If we're getting our greatest resistance here, what's going to plummet? Pressure is going to drop, but diameter is going to plummet so that our resistance goes up and our blood flow, our blood velocity goes down for the capillary. Maybe you want to make a note on the side about the arterioles. They're really just regulating the blood, getting it ready to enter to the capillaries. They're, they're setting up the capillaries because the capillaries, they can't, they don't have any muscle, they don't have any connective tissue. They, everything's got to be just right by the time the blood gets to the capillaries. And so the arterioles are going to make sure velocity, pressure, Everything is kind of handled before it gets to the capillaries. So we're going to see a huge drop in mean arterial pressure. Uh, we're going to see the blood flow change from pulsatile to, you guys said constant, but the new word that we learned today is laminar. So no longer <coughs> pulsatile, it's now laminar. And it's going to regulate the blood flow into the capillary beds. It is the arterioles that, that, is, that are more precisely controlled by constriction or dilation. Okay. So in other words, that autonomic nervous system we talked about, how it can control arterial diameter, it's right here. Okay. And so if I want to change the blood flow to a capillary bed, 
I don't directly influence the capillary bed. I influence the arterial. <coughs> if I want to change the, the traffic to a town, I influence whether or not the off-ramp is open or closed. Does that make sense? A little bit in that analogy. And that's what the arterials do. Just to review for you, um, whoop, we'll talk about, uh, I'll give an image of constriction and dilation. But um, the next statement that I have here says the difference in arterial resistance between organs is really what's going to determine the blood to a particular organ. So it's not the capillaries, it's the arterials that are going to distribute the blood throughout the body. If you're wanting more to this blood to the skin, or more blood to the liver, or more blood to the stomach, or more blood to the kidneys, or less, whatever the case may be, it's their respective controlling arterials which are going to regulate that blood flow. Okay. So a tiny amount of change in arterial diameter is going to have a profound impact on blood flow to the subsequent organ. And again, we said our arterials can constrict or dilate. This should re be reminiscent of what we learned in lab number one, I think it was. We did the homeostasis. Remember the temperature? Right? Ice. Remember freezing your arm and your face, right? And this is kind of making full circle to that first uh, lab that we did about becoming familiar with these terms, vasoconstriction and vasodilation. We can finally get a picture to summarize this. Figure 1410 in your textbook illustrates the different states of any given arterial, we can see a regular, right, kind of moderate state in the first panel. Notice its diameter. As the smooth muscle constricts, the diameter becomes less, and so the blood flow to the subsequent capillary bed would be less. Less. Okay. If I want to bring more blood flow to an organ, the arterial upstream needs to <coughs> relax or dilate. Decrease resistance, increase blood flow. The terms constriction or dilation of a blood vessel make sense? Have questions about that? All right. Arterials lead to the next structure is called capillaries. You can look at the pulmonary and systemic capillaries wherever you want. And we talked about the structure of the capillaries is pretty unique when compared to the rest of the vessels. They are anatomically the smallest of all the vessels in our body. They're only a single endothelial layer thick. They have lower resistance because all, kind of goes against what you think, but because all of the work has already been handled by which vessels? Arterial. So the blood flows, the traffic's already in the city street. It's, it's okay, right? no congestion or anything like that. So the blood flows in the capillaries, all the getting there is handled by the arterials. The diameter of the capillaries is so small that a single red blood cell can pass at a time. Okay. Now, I believe I showed a video at the beginning of the semester of the human body, didn't I? We saw the vessels, did we? We did? Okay. And so we saw the little blood going through the vessels one at a time. And so it's Analogous to that city street kind of <coughs> description. The bulk of the capillaries are arranged in what's called beds, and it ties into that greater cross sectional area. Okay, so, our capillaries take up a lot of space, they're low diameter, small diameter, and what it does is slows down the blood flow, the velocity drops so much so that the capillaries can do the job of exchanging nutrients between the blood plasma and the extracellular fluid or the interstitial fluid, right? Which is gonna serve some tissue, right? So if this is a capillary in your brain, we want the blood flow to be slow enough to allow for to drop off glucose and pick up potassium or whatever needs to be picked off, right? To make sure that that tissue is in, in a homeostasis. The process that we're gonna study between today and review tomorrow is called bulk flow. Why don't you go ahead and circle this word or underline it? That's just a term that can be used to describe many processes. We'll talk about it in the circulatory system. We'll talk about it in the respiratory system. If you're in environmental sciences, you may talk about it for 
all the river flow in the body, or, or not the river, in the, in the uh, I can't even think outside of the body, uh, the rivers of the world, right? Okay, bulk flow, we're moving a, a lot of something. But in this case, we're looking at the circulatory system. Okay, so we'll define this term, bulk flow, between today and tomorrow. This is basically going to exchange nutrients between the blood plasma and the interstitial fluid. Obviously, it's kind of intricate. That's so we're going to span it between the two days. If you look at the capillaries, the, the endothelial cells which comprise the capillaries are not all adhered together completely. So we don't have nothing. We don't have just strictly uh, tight junctions of adhering those cell types together. There's some spaces between where the cells adhere together. They're called pores, and so the capillaries are considered to be porous makes sense because we're trying to physically move substances, large volumes of substances from one spot to another. So for a visual, you ever seen one of those garden hoses that have the holes along them to sp spray out water, not just at the end, but along the way? Think of that analogous to a capillary. So think of the holes as a, an outlet, if you will, for uh, our blood plasma. <coughs> get out and actually substances could get in as well. So they do have these little pores, so we can get water, so water, soil, water soluble substances like uh, our nutrients, charged particles, whatever, can get forced through the pores of the capillaries. Lipid soluble substances clearly could go through the pores. Okay, so our steroid hormones could they're forced through the pore they could go through, but they're lipid soluble, so they could actually just diffuse from the blood plasma across the cell, which makes up the capillary. And then out. Okay. So we've got different mechanisms for, for transport. If we look at the capillaries of the brain, though, the capillaries are built a little bit differently because the brain's a whole heck of a lot more important. Now I say hate to give assignment to what's more important in the body, but we, I mean, hands down, we can argue brain's really important. We really, really, really don't want to damage the brain, right? And so it's much more restrictive where we don't find it more porous. Okay, so we have more tight junctions of the capillaries, which ties into this thing that we briefly mentioned in um, Unit 2 about the blood-brain barrier. Okay, so it's, it's a lot more restrictive. You may be more familiar with this. Um, do you have, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but maybe in your life, someone you know, close or distant, a, a brain tumor, okay? And if you're in that scenario, you know, it's a big issue is the doctors have trouble treating it, delivering drugs, because the drugs can't get out of the what? Can't get out of the capillaries okay, to get into the brain to be delivered. Because the capillaries have a tight, these tight <coughs> junctions making up these blood-brain barriers. Okay, so it's more restrictive. So that's unique to the capillaries of the brain. But the bulk of our capillaries in our body are more permeable and that they have these pores and can kind of leak out our plasma, if you will, analogous to that hose like I tried to describe a moment ago. Okay. Figure 14-18 illustrates this role of the, the pores of a capillary. And so here in figure 14-18 we have, we're looking at a capillary on its side like we've seen in the previous image. So if we're reviewing its structure, we can see individual cells in the capillary. And if we were to look at them, some of the cells would be adhered together by tight junctions, some of the areas. But then between some areas, they would not be adhered. So it's just like a big opening between the lumen of the capillary and the interstitial fluid surrounding it. So be next to this would be some cell like your skeletal muscle cell or your brain or skin or whatever, okay, trying to get nutrients. Okay. Where we're going to head now is to discuss how something can move from the tract inside of the lumen of the blood vessel out into the interstitial fluid and then vice versa. And honestly, all this is going to do is review your units, I think was it unit one where we talked about transport of molecules? This is unit one in review, chapter four basically. And so if we go back to, if we're trying to move something we really need to understand it's what? If I want to move something across a membrane, I need to understand it's what? 
polarity okay, or its solubility, right? If something is water soluble or lipid soluble, is one I need to understand. If something's lipid soluble, what can it do? It can simply diffuse across the membrane. If something's water soluble, what has to happen? It has to be carried or in the capillaries it could just it may be exocytosed across or it can just go through the pores. And so that's what this section is going to illustrate for us. Although we're done into the unit one, we really need to drive home this concept to, under, to understand the functionality of the capillaries. And so why don't you, in your handout, I have a big spot for you. Why don't you draw a uh, capillary cross section to help illustrate, reiterate the transport of water soluble and lipid soluble substances between the plasma and the interstitial fluid. In this image, although labeled, what color is the plasma in this image? On the far right, it's colored. Oh. The plasma is colored. The peach orange color is the plasma. What is the yellow? The what? Individual cells, so individual cell membranes are colored gray, so the yellow would be in cells cytoplasm. So we have plasma, we have a membrane, we have cytoplasm, we have plasma membrane, and outside of that would be interstitial fluid. Okay. So we're saying if I want to move something between the blood plasma across capillary cell into the interstitial fluid, I've got to understand is this thing charged? Is it big? Uh, is it water soluble, is it lipid soluble, what? Okay? And so this really summarizes how to move particles. If we look at this, we can see one, two, three, four, right, and a portion of a fifth cell. And you notice that we can very well see the pores, right? So it's oversimplified for us. Okay? We can see just the direct fluid connection between the interstitial fluid and the blood plasma. What type of particles could diffuse between the two? Water soluble. Water soluble substances, polar substances, could just simply diffuse through those pores. Should be bigger for So water soluble substances like oh our good friend sodium, potassium, calcium, <laughs> glucose. They can just simply diffuse through the pores. What about water-soluble substances like proteins that are physically too big to fit through the pores? They're water-soluble. Can they fit through the pores? No. So we can hear, we can see that they are rejected, right? They're going to stay in there. They're, saying they're going to stay in the blood plasma. But we can also see some proteins that are water soluble that aren't rejected. They can get out of the cell, out of the, excuse me, out of the capillary. How do they get out? They're transcytose. That term we learned early in the first unit. First, they are endocytose, traffic, and then exocytose. The cell is just like just transported right across. But some proteins can actually be vesiculated from the plasma to the exercise to the interstitial fluid. What other molecules do we need to take into consideration now? Molecules that are what? Lipid soluble. Lipid soluble substances, we said, can just simply diffuse. They can diffuse through the endothelial cells. They can even just diffuse right through the pores. They're strong. 
uh, illustrated here like your respiratory gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, cortisol, uh, or either glucocorticoid, uh, aldosterone, whatever, right? They can just simply diffuse estrogen, testosterone, they just diffuse down their concentration gradient. Add to your picture, draw like a giant red blood cell. So just draw a cross section of a giant red blood cell. To illustrate, do, the, do you think there's red blood cells exit the capillaries? No. So just draw like a cross section of a big red blood cell to illustrate that they also stay in there. Along with proteins that don't have transporters, our red blood cells remain in the capillary. Despite the pressure, trying to push them out. chapter 14, pages 394 through 429. Review what you covered today and get you ready for the rest of tomorrow's presentation. We will probably also get into chapter 15, so um, that'd be ideal if you read the selected reading pages for 15 as well. Right, we'll see you in lab or in class tomorrow.